And now we can go on to some important information about building the software. So this starts to get a bit more important to read. So it says here about building software as an unprivileged root user, or sorry, non-root user. And it says here the golden rule of Unix system administration is to only use your superpowers when necessary, i.e. you should do everything as an ordinary user except when you need to be a super user. And that generally means when you come to install software or configure software, but not compiling it or building it. So really we should have a standard user at the outset. Um, and that is something we'll be doing in this in this part is creating a user once we create some of the standard configuration files. Um, and I'll be installing sudo a little bit later as well, just so that we can more easily become the root user when we do install software. It tells you how to unpack the software. Well, as you can see, they're all all the same commanders we've been using before, tar minus xvf and then the file name of the tarball. And it suggests some different ways you can extract the data, how to check for um, checksums, the integrity of the files using the MD5 sum, uh, using the hashes that generates and log files. The way of doing that using T if you want to create a log file and also view it on the screen. And how to use multiple processors. Well, make flags. We'll be setting that when um, we've set up a uh, standard user. I won't bother setting it up at the moment while we're still using the root, but I will do um, when we come to set up the standard user. As it says, you can use uh, grep processor CPU, uh, proc CPU info. I'm not sure if that actually gives the number of real processors or not. Let's just try it. Uh, CPU info, sorry. Okay, yeah, it has listed. So that, I guess, is a way of doing it. Um, I can't remember what the processor is actually now. Whether that will give the, the correct output or not, if you've got multiple physical CPUs or not, I don't know. I assume it will, because they've got that in the book. But as I said, the way I like to do it is quite foolproof, is NPROC. Um, just gives you the number, and that's the number you, you feed into make, the make minus j command. Um, just going back to the bash, uh, the standard build units, sorry, the, sorry, I keep calling them standard bash units, because that's what they were when I started doing LFS uh, many years ago, uh, the standard build units. Uh, the times, one other thing can affect them is, is if you have multiple CPUs, um, and if you have hyperthreading, hyperthreading isn't exactly a times two uh, mechanism. So having a single core with hyperthreading hyper is not, uh, you're not going to get double the speed of, as if you had two c CPUs with single cores. Hyperthreading is a kind of a bit of a bodge. They're not genuine separate cores. Um, so that's another thing that would affect the SPU times, so that's something else to bear in mind. If you've got a process with two cores with hyperthreading, you've got eight core or eight possible threads to work on. Um, that's not the same as having, uh, for example, uh, a single CPU with four separate cores, as I've got here. Um, and there's some information there about um, some sometimes multiple processes may cause a race condition. Um, and then that's the time to run the make without the uh, jobs command uh, to make. Um, so if that happens, it says to add J1 to force it just to compile in one, uh, one job at a time. Okay, when running the package test or the install portion of the package build, we do not recommend using an option greater than J1 unless it's specified otherwise. Okay, so I've never quite known whether that's a good thing or not. And I have done minus J4 or whatever when I've been installing and testing. So that's something that I now know that I've not read before. Um, yeah, it says here the procedures or checks have not been validated using parallel procedures may fail with issues that are difficult to debug. 
So bearing that in mind, I've got to try and remember not to use make with the J4 anymore. And there's a bit there about automating the build if you wish to do that. If you're doing repetitive builds, then there's some things there. A bit about dependencies, as I've said in the introduction video, required got to install them in the mandatory otherwise either it cannot build or it won't run correctly without those dependencies recommended means that they strongly suggest that you install the package again it may not work as expected if you don't put the recommended in and optional generally means that there's added functionality and I will be installing as far as I can all the required recommended and optional packages there's a bit there about installing using the most current package sources. So if that's important to you, you can read that. Uh, there's a bit there about stripping. If you want to strip the debug symbols out of the programs, uh, that's the command to do that. So obviously you'd probably want to do that at the end, um, but not doing it in a windowing environment because you can't do it on libraries that are in use. There's a bit there about um, optimizing using the C flags and CXX flags I won't be dealing with that I might do a video on optimization build building with these optimization optimization flags in the future um, it's not as simple as C flags and CXX flags anymore because there's other build tools such as they mentioned here C make and uh, Mise and ninja and so on so it's not as easy as it once was um, oh yes, yeah, some Rust C and Cargo. So I just stick with the standard um, build as it comes. Uh, yes, you might get a faster build, but if you're careful, you, or if you're not careful, rather you can actually end up with a either a bad build or a build that runs slower. So it's probably best if, if it's the first time or you're still quite new to building LFS or BLFS, not not to bother with optimization of the compilers. It's a bit there about hardening the build if you're interested in uh, sort of security aspects of it. It's a bit here about um, whether programs should go in the user directory or the user local directory. You can read that if you want. My recommendation is just to go with what BLFS does and that's what they do as it says there they're all installed in the user and optional instructions you will see some packages go into the op directory and they tend to be packages that are quite easy to uh, update um, they're quite standalone so they can go in their own standalone directory um, there's a bit there about optional patch, pack, patches i will be installing all optional patches assuming they do something useful um, if it's something trivial and poor depends on how i feel i suppose Boot scripts, we've already seen the boot scripts, we've already downloaded this package and installed the boot script for GPM. And we've seen that booting up as you can see on the screen there. There's a bit about libtool archive files. Um, this does start to get a problem as we install more and more libraries. So we may have to come back, well, in fact, we could do this now actually. Um, we, if we now copy this script in um, it will be there for us to use to clean out these files so let's do that now uh, so I'm going to go back to the terminal going to locate this part in the book let's jump straight to it so it's there about loop tool archive files and using the mouse on the terminal let's find the page we can copy from the cat command down to here go back to our input terminal which is on the virtual screen one and just paste that in it should yep should paste it all in go back again go to page two and copy the rest of it uh, actually it was a blank line at the bottom of that first one if that's important to you so let's just put that blank line in like that and then all of this back to the first terminal and right click to paste it back to the second terminal alt, alt F2 press space 
and then just copy the last bit the EOF and the chmod bit that should finish running the script in and should run that change mode command to make it executable all in one go so let's right click that and yep that seems to have work, worked so let's first of all just have a look at it so there it is you can see the execute flag is on for everybody it's owned by root because we're root at the moment and you can see it's got some size to it because it's 1527 bytes so let's have a quick edit of it now just see how it's copied sometimes when we copy from the terminal um, we get all sorts of spaces and tabs that mess the mess the indentation up but it seems like it's copied quite well in fact it's copied very well sometimes I've had problems with this and it's not copied very well at all so that's that's quite good there's no like extra editing we need to do with this there's some notes about user notes there let's just quickly get that up see if that says anything useful no, there's no page there at the moment it's a bit unfortunate but basically um, I th as I remember you start to get some errors with libraries that won't build properly or packages won't build because of these LA files and all you do is you, you run this script and it goes and finds that there's some there already it's re renamed them it's backed them up basically um, that's all there is to it if I run that again you see that there's nothing to do because it's, it's moved those files out of the way. So you can run that any time you think you might need it. It's probably best to run them, run the, the program just before you run in a big package like Qt, for example, or Firefox, something like that. So there's a, another sort of mini debate here about whether libraries should be static or shared. I'm not going to go into that. We're just, we're just following the BLFS instructions verbatim. Um, obviously once you've got your feet in and you're knowing, knowing your way around a little bit you might decide well this is important to me I need to or I want to do things differently some things here about locale related issues um, it's not normally a problem in English speaking countries it may be in other countries other locale so you may want to read this um, it suggests things to do here to fix them um, so I won't be going through here there's this script here which identifies any manual pages it says here packages stored manual pages in incorrect and non-displayable encoding this does affect English because it's won't recognize manuals that are in UTF-8 encoding so again if this is a problem you can run this script and yeah maybe do something about these manual pages and we can run this script in as well if you want actually let's go on here and actually copy that script in Right, okay, it's actually over two pages, is it? Uh, all right, yeah, early to archive. All right, let me go back to the list. I've got lost there a bit. Early to archive important information. Oh yeah, look how I said I was on the right page. So yeah, there's the beginning of the script there. So there's no cat command to run it in. So we're going to have to do via manually and just paste it into via. So this is needs good put somewhere. So I would suggest to put it in user. Uh, Yeah, probably user source would be a good. Uh, sorry, user. Um, 
local is it local yeah that might be a good place to put it if you find it's not a good place to put it you can move it maybe to user uh, sorry not user I'm not talking about bin local user sorry user bin that's where I meant user bin if you find that's not a good enough place for you then you might want to stick it in bin perhaps um, as long as it's on your path somewhere that you can access the script then that's that's more than enough you can see the name of the file is checkman.sh so let's just type that, type that in checkman.sh go into insert and we need to go back to the other terminal alt f2 copy these two lines in back to f1 right click to paste it back to f2 space bar for the next screen just copy the last bit and right click that okay so this is where the tabs have gone so it looks like it might be via that messes up the the tabbing so what I'll do is just get rid of these extra spaces and manually adjust this so that it's indented correctly without deleting anything important okay so that's that save it and then it says yeah if it's not in your path environment variable to modify it so I'm oh, sorry we can't copy this can we? we've got to go back to F2 and just highlight that line you can try running it and you'll see it will come up with stuff uh, if you highlight just that and you paste it in it will paste it in if you highlight past the line there's a chance you'll pick up the underlying character and it will actually run it as well. So you want to be careful that you just copy what you need uh, uh, unless you're sure you want to run it straight away. Uh, okay, right. So we need to give this um, execute permissions. So let's do chmod plus x slash user slash bin check man dot sh now I can rerun this find command and you can see it's found all these web pages that have got UTF-8 as it's suggested in the get the right mouse in the book here so if that's a problem that's something you might need to look into and as it says here, if you've got the main pages located in any other location that you need to modify this directory here and there's a bit about going beyond LFS if you want to build anything that's not in the book. Uh, it tells you some details about where things are and so on. Uh, but I do intend to build at least one package that's not in the book just to show how it can be done quite easily. So there's lots of 